The Buckeyes wrap up their spring sessions on Saturday, and everyone in the nation will be able to see. It's on Fox Noon Eastern Time from Ohio Stadium. We got uh, Pat Murphy, Bucknuts 247 Sports, to break down what he expects to see out of Ohio State coming up on Saturday. Pat, how's it going? I'm good, Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. And uh, yeah, just the fact that uh, Fox is picking up the quote unquote game. And then I noticed Michigan gets the call on Fox the very next Saturday at noon Eastern time. And I'm going to make a wager that they're the only two that are going to get that distinction. And so, of course, Fox showing us where their cash cows are. So that's no big surprise there. Uh, in terms of before we get to the nuts and bolts of the personnel on the field, uh, you know, there there have been uh, pushes in the past to make a certain attendance figure to show out, to show the other big programs in the country. We're going to pack the house with 90,000 or whatever the number estimate was. Is there any particular buzz surrounding this uh, weekend and, and what else is going on in regards to the, 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 the events across the campus? I think that as we get through this week, the buzz will grow. Um, I, I do believe that there's some excitement about this game, just given you know, kind of some of the new faces. Now, there's obviously a lot of older faces, but you've got key positions, you know, quarterback battle, right? A guy in Devin Brown, he haven't seen too much of, and Will Howard coming in, and you've got Julian Sayan and, and Aaron Nolan, the two freshmen um, that could potentially play in the game as well for fans to see for the first time. Obviously, on defensive side of the ball, Caleb Downs, you assume, will be out there. Fans just get to see him. Uh, Quinshawn Judkins, the running back. So there are some interesting you know, new additions to this team, despite the fact that there are so many veterans coming back. And I think people are just excited in general for what this team is going to look like, right? Now, I say that. I was talking to a buddy the other day who is as big of an Ohio State fan as, as there is out there. And he's excited for the spring game. I asked if he was going to go, and he said, no, I'll just watch it on TV. I think he's going golfing that morning. And I was like, this seems like a spring game you'd want to be at. And he's like, well, you know, they don't play. You know, It's not like they've done it under Ryan Day with a full game where you actually just get to see two teams go at it, and they play 60 minutes, and you know, it's, it's a full game. So I do think that the way that Ohio State has handled the spring games in recent years – players switching teams and, and it's kind of hard to keep track. You know, sometimes it's been just offense versus defense. We haven't gotten a format yet on how it will look on Saturday, but I do think that people are maybe a little less excited than if Ryan day or, or, or Ohio state came out and said, we're going to play, we're going to draft two teams. We're going to play straight up. You know, obviously you're not going to hit the quarterbacks and things like that, that you would never do in a scrimmage, but we're going to do a full scrimmage live on Fox I think there may be more excited about that, and, and maybe they will. Maybe that will be um, what, what Ryan Day says when we talk to him later this week. But um, the past has indicated that they sort of use this as a modified practice more so than a full-on scrimmage. And I think unless you are really into some of the nuts and bolts of, of a football practice, um, that's just not as exciting as, as it would be if they actually played a game. And I think forums like this, conversations like this, and the general public's acknowledgement and understanding of what the spring game is today versus what it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is a little bit different. When they would read their one or two Ohio State articles in the paper every day through, throughout spring practice, and then bam, we get to see uh, Ohio State on the field for one day versus okay, I got clips on social media, I'm keeping up with everything. And then again, conversations like this to point out and emphasize this is one out of 15 sessions. It's a big deal because we get to see it. However, it's not any more important than every other day in practice to a certain extent. So we can kind of uh, put the brakes on any over exaggerations of evaluations that are going to happen on Saturday. That yeah. said, we do get to see them on the field. Uh, together in all of that. Pat, why don't we uh, sit down at the quarterback position since you started in that direction? And uh, there's uh, room, uh, there's word out there, I should say, that Lincoln Keenholz is looking to move on, that uh, he would be the odd man out. Uh, other than that, um, has there been any indication by Ryan Day how these quarterbacks are going to be utilized and how much we're going to see of whom 
I would assume there has not been. Uh, again, we'll talk to Ryan Day later this week, so maybe we'll get some more clarity on on all that. But I would assume they would handle it similarly to what they've done throughout spring um, with, with Devin Brown and Will Howard kind of handling most of the first team reps. You know, if you are going to break into two separate teams instead of doing offense versus defense, it would make sense that each of those quarterbacks leads one of the teams. Um, would That would be my expectation. I think this is a big opportunity for Will Howard because he comes in with a lot of buzz being the Kansas State guy. Everyone expects him to be the starter. And by all accounts, spring has just kind of been, I don't want to say poor, but maybe a little ho-hum as he settles into a new offense, you know, stepping up a bit of a level from Kansas State, no offense to, to the Wildcats, but to Ohio State and, and all the talent around him there. And so I think it's it's just taken him some time to settle in. And we've seen some of that. We've heard some of that. Devin Brown has looked good by all accounts. So if Will Howard can go out and leave kind of this lasting impression on the spring game of, hey, look, I'm right here with Devin Brown, or, or maybe even, you know, he goes out and outperforms Devin Brown. It's one of 15 practices, right? And they'll all be evaluated by Ryan Day and Chip Kelly and the offensive coaching staff. But you would like, if you are Will Howard, for at least people to be talking about you positively throughout the offseason. Uh, you mentioned Lincoln Keenholz. When it comes to quarterbacks and transferring, I don't know what to expect from this room. Uh, if I think a lot of other places, Devin Brown would have been gone a year ago when he didn't win the job. Kyle McCord, he keeps saying all of those right things to get people to, to you know, at least kind of get off his back about the transfer portal stuff. You can tell it's kind of gotten to him a little bit. If he's going to live up to, to those words, then he's going to stick through it regardless. Um, you know, something that a lot of people haven't talked about because of the way college football is set up these days and, and the rules that are now in place. I mean, if things don't look good for Will Howard, he could theoretically jump back in the portal after the spring game and look to find another place where he has more of a, a clear path to starting. I don't think that happens, but it's not out of the question. The freshman quarterbacks, we've heard a lot of good things about Julian saying, um, I think especially as a freshman coming in, he has looked much more college ready than, uh, you know, maybe not than you'd expect. He was one or two in terms of the quarterback rankings, depending on which service you look at uh, in the 2024 class. But not so much on Aaron Nolan, right? Student Appreciation Day a couple weeks ago, uh, he does not take part. Ryan Day sort of insinuated without actually saying it that he was dealing with some injuries. So, you know, that may keep him out. But if you're Aaron Nolan and you see Julian Sain doing well, do you jump in the transfer portal to go find a place where, okay, I'm not competing with another guy in my class that is as good, if not better than me? This is all speculation on my part because, as I said, it's hard to figure out what's going to happen with the transfer portal in this position room because you just never know. I think really I would put pretty much all of those guys still on transfer portal watch, obviously some with different levels of, of confidence that they will stay, but I would not be shocked if any of them enter the transfer portal, um, you know, kind of depending on how things finish up this week and the conversations they have with the coaching staff. What is not conjecture is the transfer of Dallin Hayden that has been made official in regards to him entering the transfer portal Hate to see him go. He obviously had his high points. Uh, there were very few, but very few opportunities. And every time he got one, he seemed to seize the moment and step up big. Now, in his place, uh, there are all sorts of inexperienced names. James Peoples obviously has a big reputation coming in as a true freshman. Sam Williams Dixon, TC Kathy is uh, as a former walk-on is showing big things at camp as well. Of course, the number three running back spot is not a big deal until somebody gets hurt and then suddenly that guy's the number two guy and he's getting 10 or 12 meaningful carries against good opponents during the season and it does become a big deal so who do you think uh, is in line to possibly step up there well i think you mentioned james peoples he is if you're looking at the roster right now i think he's the most likely though i do think tc caffey um you know as a guy who is still a walk-on we did confirm this when we talked to him this spring before he got hurt, I think it was last year, showed some things, right? And so he's a guy who could step in if you need somebody with a little bit more experience. Um, 
look, I think the ideal situation for Ohio State is Dallin Hay, or excuse me, Travion Henderson, Quinshawn Judkins stay healthy. You rotate those two so neither of them get severely beat up throughout the course of the season. You bring in James Peoples in, in garbage time or maybe as kind of the third back, and you go from there. There's also the transfer portal, and I don't know how many times we say transfer portal on this show, but uh, I think it could, if you counted, if you tallied those, I think it would be pretty high. The Buckeyes could certainly go find a guy uh, in the transfer portal. There's been some some rumors out there already. We'll see what happens once the portal opens. I think it's a tricky situation because you're asking a guy to come in and be the third back this year with the possibility of playing next year if, well, we know Travion Henderson will be gone. If Quinshawn Judkin also, Judkins also leaves, well, do you want to come in, transfer in, and sit for a year more or less and, and you know maybe get some carries here or there? I don't know. Uh, there are definitely other opportunities out there. Plus, as we mentioned, you've got James Peoples. You've got Sam Williams Dixon, who I think is interesting because he himself has said he sees himself similar to a Curtis Samuel. Well, if you remember Curtis Samuel's career, he starts off at running back as the backup to Ezekiel Elliott ends up at wide receiver when he heads to the NFL draft. So we'll see where Sam Williams Dixon ends up. Um, if, but if we're talking 2024, unless you go find a third back that can essentially be your new Dallin Hayden, I think you just hope for the best with the the top two guys. Uh, obviously, Travion Henderson, he's missed eight games the last two seasons. So you're a little worried there. Um, you do hope with another talented back like Quinchon Judkins, he doesn't have to carry as much of the workload. But Quinchon Judkins has... I think if he's not the most, he's top three in terms of carries the last two seasons, those hits start to add up, right? And you hope that this isn't the year when he misses some time because he's he's taken a lot of pounding on his body. Um, but yes, I think right now you, you, you will look at the transfer portal for sure. Obviously, Ohio State's been evaluating James Peoples throughout this process. I don't think Dallin Hayden's decision to jump in the transfer portal, uh, which hasn't been officially announced yet, but we have it on pretty good authority that that will happen. Um, I don't think that this is a surprise to Ohio State. So I am sure that there is some sort of plan in place to, to figure out what to do with these running backs. To compound matters, you just brought in a new running backs coach in Carlos Lachlan, who just met all of these guys more or less last week. Now, he did know uh, Quinshawn Judkins and had a relationship with Dallin Hayden previously, but it's not like you had this run, you know, Tony Alfred's still here and he's been able to plan for all this. It's a brand new guy running that room too. So a lot up in the air when it comes to uh, the running backs. Fortunately, sitting at the top of that room are two very talented players that uh, the Buckeyes are pretty confident in. Pat, uh, for those fans who are take a very technical uh, approach to these games and are really into the personnel and the nuts and bolts. The offensive line is probably the place to look first and foremost, and that's not uncommon across the country that the offensive line is the the position that needs to be worked out more so than any other. It requires the most chemistry, requires the most players, and in terms of matchups and combinations and so forth. So what are you looking for there? Well, the right side of the offensive line is is the biggest question. It was the question coming into the spring. Um, it remains a question coming out of the spring. Um, we've gotten some answers. Uh, the Josh Fryer situation was one where, okay, is he going to move to right guard? We kind of got going for Ohio State a couple of years ago uh, as, as the like sixth offensive lineman. Does he stay at right tackle? Can he improve enough? from that right tackle position that we saw a year ago to really lock that down. Luke Montgomery is a guy who's been in the mix, mostly at right guard, but apparently he's also done some tackle. Tegra Shabola as well. Uh, for me, that's that's one of the biggest questions on the off or on the offense, the entire offense. If you can get that figured out and you feel confident about it. You've got Josh Simmons, who I think the second half of last year started to play better. He has been talked up quite a bit this offseason his first offseason with the Buckeyes remember he arrived in June last year from San Diego State uh you got Donovan Jackson back center there's definitely a competition there between Carson Hinsman who started pretty much all of last season for the Buckeyes and then Seth McLaughlin who McLaughlin who transferred from Alabama but I think either way you feel pretty good about one of those two guys just given they've both played um at a high level so for me, that right side is where 
you're going to make or break this offensive line. If you get it right, uh, and the way I think it's lined up right now is Josh Fryer, right tackle, Luke Montgomery, right guard. Um, if you get that right, then I think you're in a pretty good spot as you move forward. But, you know, we're, we, I said this last time I was on, Mark. I feel like we're having the same similar conversations that we did a year ago coming out of the spring about the offensive line. Then it was both tackles. Now it's right guard, right tackle. Uh, and I also don't think bringing up our favorite two words here, the transfer portal is not out of the conversation here. If the Buckeyes see a guy that they know can come in and be a dominant tackle for them that enters the portal after uh, after spring practice is done, I think they will certainly go and, and at least explore that option. Uh, I don't think anyone at either of those positions has completely set it and forget it uh, themselves this spring, but you need the right guy to enter, right? You don't just want to take a guy and add a body for no reason. So certainly something to keep an eye on, but yes, I will be watching. I'm hoping that the way they set it up is we do get to see Luke er, Montgomery and Josh Fryer next to each other to see how that looks on the offensive line in the spring game. It is the Scarlet versus the Gray, noon Eastern time, Fox. If you're going to watch it from home, of course, Ohio Stadium is the place to be. We've got Pat Murphy here, Bucknuts 247 Sports. And uh, we talked about uh, the complexity of the offensive line and the various uh, matchups there. Then for those folks that just want to see, you know, Jeremiah Smith make a one-handed catch and a toe tap in the back of the end zone, and they're just looking for excitement, uh, there's going to be a lot of eyes on that young man. Absolutely. And I realized when I was listing new faces earlier, I did not mention Jeremiah Smith. That is not because I don't think people are excited to see him. Just slipped my mind as I was talking about other guys. Wrote about Jeremiah Smith, Julian saying just yesterday, and, and if these guys can start for Ohio State, um, you can read that on Bucknuts, but – Long story short, Jeremiah Smith is certainly in that conversation. He walks into an Ohio State wide receiver room at really about the perfect time to be a young player looking for playing time. You lose Marvin Harrison Jr. to the draft. You lose Julian Fleming to the transfer portal. Even Xavier Johnson, um, who, who put up some decent numbers for Ohio State. So there's opportunity there in terms of snaps, in terms of production. Yes, you have uh, Jaden Ballard, who's going into his fourth year and has done some things in practice that make you think, okay, maybe the light bulb has come on for him. Carnell Tate, Brandon Ennis, both going to their sophomore seasons. Um, so it's not like there is an absolute clear path to playing time, but Jeremiah Smith's different. And, you know, Mark, we've been talking periodically throughout the years, these last several years. I don't generally hype up freshmen a lot. I need to see it before I can uh, really believe it. And I mean, see it on the field on Saturdays. But what we have seen of Jeremiah Smith and then talking to people about Jeremiah Smith including a guy like Brian Hartline, who is very hesitant to play freshman wide receivers early. It's clear that there's something different about him. And like you said, there are the social media posts of those catches and, and things like that. And obviously he will need to do more than just make highlight catches to be a big part of this offense. You've got to block. Uh, there's route running things that, you know, you're not always getting the ball when you run certain routes, stuff like that, that he has to continue to improve on and, and learn and whatnot. But by all accounts, he has taken the necessary steps this spring. I expect that to continue, and, and he's just different. I mean, he doesn't look like a freshman. I think of Marvin Harrison Jr. when he came in, and we obviously know how his career went. Marvin Harrison was tall, but he was very skinny, and you know, obviously he had the pedigree with his dad, and you could see when he was on the field that he maybe was a little bit ahead of some of the other freshman wide receivers just because of that. But just physically, Jeremiah Smith looks like he's already been in this program a year, and I think that helps set him apart. The talent. I mean, this was the top ranked player in the country in the 24 seven sports rankings that rarely goes to a wide receiver. It's almost always a quarterback or a defensive lineman, uh, occasionally an offensive lineman to give it to a wide receiver. That tells you what you need to know about this kid. And if, if you haven't seen enough of him, if you, if you weren't able to be at the student appreciation day, cause you're not a student or whatever Saturday should give you a pretty good idea. I would imagine. So, Pat, on the defensive side, what I'm thinking is because of all the guys that return, uh, it's a pretty well set lineup. But those like, third and fourth corner positions are interesting. And then just overall depth, um, you know, backups along the defensive front and really on all three levels. Yeah, I mean, I think you could, you know, anyone who paid attention 
last season, this off season to, to this team could probably figure out who are going to be the starting four defensive linemen, uh, JT to and Jack Sawyer in the ends, uh, Tyleek Williams and Ty Hamilton as, as the defensive tackles. You're right. I think the only question with them is, can you be more statistically productive than they have been uh, the last couple of years? I think that's a little bit overblown because I still think they were effective. Um, you obviously lose Mike Hall from that group, but I think it's a group that gets the job done. Doesn't always result in sacks in the quarterback. Now, I do think with the way Jack Sawyer ended last season, you started to see him really come on. If he can build on that, great. Now you're uh, now you've maybe got your guy who is going to be statistically the leader of that group. Um, but you're, yes, after those guys, it's it's depth. You know, how far has Hiro Kanu come? The the German born entering his third year here, started football kind of late in his American football late in his life. Um, Mitchell Melton on the end. He's a guy we've heard a lot about, but has dealt with injuries. Uh, Caden Curry, um, you know, the Kenyatta Jackson uh, also ends guys like that. Like where are they in their progression and how much do they take some of the responsibility off the starters to come out of games? Because in order to do that, the level can't drop. You need to be able to play at the same level. Larry Johnson has, has always said this. Um, and if you could get back to, when I think it was Chase Young's freshman year, maybe even a little bit earlier than that. But when they started that Rushman group of the Bosa, one of the Bosa brothers, Sam Hubbard, uh, um, what's his name, who's on the Indianapolis Colts now, the defensive end. Um, so many guys running through my head right now. But anyway, the point is, you want to have a group that's going to be able to rotate it in, keep guys fresh, but the number or the, the production – the, the level of play does not drop off. And Ohio State hasn't had that in the last couple of years. The hope is that they've got it now. And that's not just on the outside. That's on the interior as well, where you want to be able to rotate. So that'll be the question. See how these guys look beyond the, that starting four. Yeah, that cornerback position, uh, how do you see that past the, the, the front two guys? Yeah, I mean, Jermaine Matthews was the guy who emerged last season as a freshman. Um, He's a guy who I think in most other situations is probably setting himself up to start this year. Maybe even would have started late last season um, in, at other programs where you don't have Denzel Burke, Davis and Igbenosin as you're starting to uh, beyond him, Calvin Simpson hunt. He was a higher rated uh, cornerback coming out of high school than, um, than Jermaine Matthews. So can he take that next step as well? Um, you're certainly going to want the depth. I think the depth at all of these positions is going to be important because you're going to have this long season. You mentioned injuries. We've seen that with Denzel Burke in the past. Um, those are the two that probably are most likely in my mind, at least to kind of be a part of, of any sort of rotation. But I do think you're going to play a lot of Davis and Igbenos and you're going to play a lot of Denzel Burke on the outside. Just uh, watching the scarlet and gray out on the field at Ohio Stadium does something to everyone that loves Ohio State football, regardless of what it means. But uh, many things to be decided, especially offensive line and uh, a few other spots there. Uh, Pat Murphy, Bucknuts 247 Sports, place to be to catch Pat's work on a regular basis. Uh, Pat, we appreciate you stopping by, breaking things down for us. Absolutely. Tyquan Lewis, that was the defensive end. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would have not been able to come up with that name. But, of course, yeah, Taekwon Lewis. I've not thought about him since he stepped off campus. All right. Thanks a lot, Pat. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Mark.